Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott. As I begin to prepare for my final verdict on the Sony a7R Mark IV, as I've been going through the review series over this past month, I recognize that there was still one area where I needed to spend a little time clearing up maybe some misconceptions and helping people out who are considering the a7R Mark IV. And that challenge comes in with the resolution. Now, to this point, we've done an overview and a comparison to the a7R Mark III. We've taken a look at sensor performance in general when it comes to dynamic range, high ISO, things like that. Uh, we've also taken a look at the autofocus performance in episodes, and all of those can be found in this playlist here. Today, however, I want to really examine the reality of 61 megapixels, which of course is the highest currently available resolution of any 35 millimeter full frame sensor. And so how does that actually play out? What are the pros and the cons of 61 megapixels or any, really any uh, very high resolution camera? And so let me give you a few details here today and then show you a lot of stuff as a part of that. First of all, one of the trade-offs, of course, you're gonna have to deal with is the reality of not just storing but processing significantly larger file sizes. With the A9 or the A7 III and its 24 megapixels, the uncompressed RAW files are around 47.2 megabytes on average, 23.8 in compressed uh, fashion. With the A7R Mark III and its 42 megapixel sensor, that jumps to about 82 megabytes for uncompressed RAW and around 41 megabytes for the compressed RAW files. And then of course with the R4, you jump up to uh, somewhere around 120 megabytes for an uncompressed RAW and then 61 megabytes per per uh, compressed RAW. And so of course, that's a lot of additional storage space. Your storage space is growing, um, in this case, by you know about 50% more. And, and so that just, you know, that, there's a reality that comes with that, not just in storage, but of course in processing. So if you've been using the A7R Mark III and your computer or your workstation can handle processing those files, there's probably a fairly good chance you'll be able to handle the R4. But there is a reality that comes with larger file size. Another area where um, we've already noted a little bit, but I'll show you also today compared to the A9, where the R4 is going to be a little bit disadvantaged is when it comes to high ISO performance. Now, I will say that I think that Sony has done a good job of mitigating the high ISO performance. You know, when I reviewed the 5DSR from Canon, uh, it was seriously disadvantaged to where you, you know, starting from about ISO 6400 on, you, it became almost unusable. And so uh, certainly Sony has done a better job on that. But as we'll, we'll take a quick look here, there is certainly a price to pay when you pack a whole lot more pixels into the same sensor area when it comes to high ISO, mostly because as we're going to discover in a moment, those, that noise occupies more pixels, thus becomes more obvious. There's one other flaw that we'll take a look at as well. So while we have thoroughly explored the comparison between the R3 and the R4, let's see how the A9 and its much lower resolution 24 megapixel sensor, and thus similarly the A7 III, how that comes into the equation at higher ISOs. So, I mean, obviously there is a huge difference in magnification that's due to a huge difference in resolution. Now, in this case, of course, that advantages the A9. And, and so, as you can see, at uh, ISO 6400, it has a very nice, clean-looking background, whereas the background you know, noise is already quite rough um, in the A7R 4 Likewise, if we look in the uh, foreground here, you, know, you can see there's very, very minimal amounts of pattern noise here and much more obvious, rougher-looking noise there. In terms of you know noise at a pixel level, you know even on your subjects, obviously the A9's images it looks cleaner here, and uh, and so you know looking down here in this uniform text, it's it looks just really really clean on the A9 here on the um, R4 it doesn't look bad, but you can definitely see pattern noise, and then over on this side. We can likewise see. Now, at this point, note color fidelity is pretty similar between the two, and, and so we'll see that changes a little bit as we move up. So if we move up a stop to ISO 12800, um, we can see looking at the image globally, you know, neither image looks all that bad. Zooming in here to a pixel level, we can see looking at our background, the, you know, the A9's background really doesn't look all that different. You do see a little bit of pattern noise there. It's obviously much more obvious at the higher pixel density of the R4. Likewise, if we look down in this area, you know, it now looks quite rough. 
and uh, the, the A9 still looks pretty smooth. Looking at the purple here, we can see that the, you know, the color, maybe saturation levels favor the A9 a little bit now, as you can see compared to that. And also the, the basic roughness. Looking at the clock face, you know, it looks great on the A9. The reds, you know, there's definitely some noise there, but at the same time, this is not a, a terrible performance by the a, A7R Mark IV either. It's just there's, you can tell everywhere there's more apparent noise. So at the very top of the heap here, what I've done is I've actually downsampled to the same resolution. So both of them are 6,000 pixels on the long end, 4,000 on the short end. Um, and so what you can see looking at a global level is that here at higher ISOs, you know, compressing down, downsampling does not you know, deal with the, the color contrast or the color tinting that's uh, come into the image. So you can definitely see a green bias that's entered into the R4 image, whereas our colors have stayed really, really neutral at this high ISO level of 25,600. Now I will point out that what I've done here actually advantages the R4's image, but it also gives us a little bit more of an apples to apples image. And so what we can see is that even with the favorable conditions for the R4, a tremendous amount of downsampling, it still is rougher in the background uh, than what it is on the A9 or the A7 III. And I, from what I understand, the, a, the A9 Mark II is maybe even a hair better at higher ISOs, a little cleaner. What we can see is that even at equal pixel levels, we've got a better performance from the A9 than we do the R4. And so you can definitely see you know, how, still how neutral the color is here compared to that. Now, if we take a quick look at the A9 versus the R3, you can see the R3 doesn't have quite as much color tint here, also down sample to this level, but it definitely doesn't stay as neutral as what the A9 does. And so again, I mean, you use cameras according to their strengths. If you're, you want to shoot in, you know, in event settings and your priority is getting very high ISO shooting or having to shoot at high ISO levels, the A9 and the A7 III remain really, really good options for that because they deliver some of the very best a high ISO performance that I've ever seen of any camera. So as we can see, it's not just the apparent roughness of the noise that is a factor. There is also um, the strongest amount of, of tint, a green tint that enters into of these three different sensors that we've compared. And so that is a certainly a liability if you're, you know, priority shooting in high ISO situations. The R4 is probably not your top choice for that situation. Now, a huge misconception that a lot of people have, and part of that, I believe, comes down to some of the marketing hype that you know companies are doing. Uh, Sony does it with GM lenses, you know, and then I've seen other uh, companies do something similar, where they're really touting how that their lenses can resolve, you know, 50 or 100 megapixels, and uh, and so it creates this this I think false illusion in people's mind that only certain lenses will be able to hardly work at all on a high megapixel body. The reality the reality is, is that lenses don't get worse when you mount them on a, a higher resolution body. That simply isn't true. What it does mean, however, is that when people look to compare, they look at a one-to-one -one pixel level. And so at a one-to-one -one pixel level, what that means is that number one, images don't necessarily look sharper at a one-to-one -one pixel level. It doesn't mean that each pixel level is sharper. It just means that there's a lot more pixels to work with. And we'll see some advantages of that in just a moment. But what it also means is that the flaws that are there, say chromatic aberrations, instead of those chromatic aberrations occupying, you know, a few pixels over a very small area, they will occupy more pixels and have a higher magnification level. In other words, you see the flaws more precisely. There's not actually more flaws there because resolution can't change the optical properties of the actual lens. That's a, you know, that is a, a mechanical design, an optical design that is going to stay true no matter what camera you have it attached to. However, certain resolutions will magnify certain flaws. And so if you're looking at a pixel level, you will see more flaws perhaps, um, or the flaws I should say will become more apparent. However, if you're looking at a global level, or if you're down sampled to the same pixel amount of pixel density, those flaws are not larger. And in fact, a lot of times higher resolution bodies give you options for limiting things like moray or uh, other issues like that. And so um, let's move beyond that, however, and let's take a look at some actual lenses. And so um, these are just lenses that I either had on hand for review or you know just lenses from my kit. We'll just take a quick look at a number of them and see how they hold up on the A7R Mark IV. 
This is the Canon 100 to 400 L Mark II adapted, and uh, we can see here with a telephoto that it has resolved just fine, wide open here on the A7R Mark IV. Here we have the Zeiss Milvus 135 millimeter F2, and as we can see, unsurprisingly, the Milvus has no problem; it resolves just fine on the R4. Here's another adapted lens. This is the Irix 150 millimeter f2.8 macro lens. And as we can see, we look at a pixel level, it resolves just fine on the R4. Sigma 14 to 24 millimeter f2.8. We can see that it certainly resolves and looks just fine here on the A7R Mark IV. This is the Tamron 17 to 28 millimeter f2.8 at f2.8. And as we can see, it resolves just fine on the R4. This is the Tamron 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8. And as we can see, it resolves just fine, an incredible amount of resolution here on the R4. The Sony Zeiss Planar 50 millimeter f1.4 at f1.4. And once again, we can see that it resolves just fine on the R4. The Samyang AF 35mm f1.4, and even though we're near the end of the frame, edge of the frame and at f1.4, there is the tiniest bit of haze here, but it is resolving just fine on the R4 sensor. The Samyang AF 45mm f1.8 at f1.8, and as we can see, it resolves just fine and looks good here on the R4 sensor. Samyang AF 85mm f1.4 at f1.4 in a portrait situation. As you can see, it resolves beautifully here on the R4. Voigtlander 65mm f2 at f2. And as we can see, no problems here, lots of resolution. It looks fantastic on the R4. Now, my exception to the rule was when I tried to put my vintage glass on here. This is an SMC Tacumar 50mm f1.4 at f1.4. And as we can see, um, it really highlights the flaws in the image. It wasn't designed to resolve a sensor this high. Ditto for the Helios 44-2, a 58mm f2 lens. As you can see, it definitely highlights the optical shortcomings and lack of contrast wide open on this lens. The bottom line is that what happens is that flaws occupy more pixels. And so for example, here we can see that on the left side, this is shot on the A9. We can see that it's the same coma, but because it occupies so many fewer pixels, you can hardly see it. Here, because it occupies many more pixels, it becomes much more apparent. That's the only reality that comes with a higher resolution sensor. So as you can see outside of my vintage lenses, and of course the problem with the vintage lenses is that they tend to have more optical flaws. They're less corrected and thus those optical flaws look much more magnified on a you know, 61 megapixel camera than what it did when I was using them say on my you know, 20 megapixel uh, you know, Canon 6D. And so um, just much more apparent. But there are some huge benefits when it comes to resolution. So I don't want to paint a negative picture here. Let's take a quick look at how resolution can be incredibly beneficial when it comes to deep cropping. If you uh, want some flexibility, you know, a lot of flexibility when it comes to cropping, that's really where this comes into play. So on the left side, we have the full image shot at 28 millimeters. On the right side, we have what appears to be, you know, something more like a you know, 100 to 150 millimeter telephoto view of this scene. And what it is, of course, is just a crop from that. And as you can see that while obviously we can't zoom as deeply into this image right now, um, you can see that there is still great amounts of detail. And for any kind of photo sharing site, you still got uh, its crop down to a resolution of over 2200 pixels. Um, on the long end. And so it's still plenty of resolution to share on just about any um, photo sharing site. And so one huge advantage there. So here's another case in point. I shot this with the DuSigma 35 millimeter f1.2 lens. And so 35 millimeters in this case really left me with a foreground that I don't really necessarily love. Um, you know, it's, an, but I had really no option because uh, I couldn't get any closer because of the location to this particular scene. And so uh, first of all, I have the option of just kind of cropping down 
and eliminating you know some of that foreground and so I could compose this way of course the sky is not particularly interesting here either and so I've got a third option that here I cropped into a 16.9 and so I have just the interesting part of the scene and of course um, I can still zoom into this and have a fantastic amount of resolution that's being resolved here in the particular scene. And so there that resolution is giving me plenty of options. And by the way, let's just take a quick peek here. Um, the cropped resolution is 5987. So on the long end, say for example, the A7 III or the A9, A9 Mark II, their resolution is 6,000 pixels on the long end. And so what we have got here is essentially after that deep, deep crop, we have still got A9 levels of resolution, which by the way is plenty for, uh, for printing in just about all applications. So there's at least one value of having a lot of resolution to begin with. Now in the same vein, we also have a huge advantage on the A7R Mark IV. I think one of the most significant advantages, and that is that it has a fully productive APS-C crop mode at a little over 26 megapixels. And so let's take a look at how the 26 megapixel APS-C crop mode of the A7R Mark IV compares to um, you know, the A6500, for example, and it's 24 megapixels. Here I've got a comparison to the A6500. In both cases, we're using the Sigma 60 millimeter f2.8 um, DN lens. And so it's a really nicely sharp lens, particularly when stopped down to f5.6. And so taking a look, um, A6500 on the left and uh, A7R Mark IV on the right. So you can see in terms of the magnification, magnification is slightly higher so that's just because there's a little bit more pixels at play here. And so as you can see, resolution looks very good. Um, if we look down into this, you can see there is ever so slightly a little bit more texture information showing there. Looking down at the, um, the books underneath here, uh, what we can see is that, you know, you can see just a little bit more of the texture information there. And so we've definitely got a, a great amount of information that's being resolved in the crop mode. And in some ways, I would say that um, looking at this, you can look over here on the Kodak side, uh, what we can see is that I believe that certainly the A7R4's crop mode is giving just as good, if not slightly better uh, resolution. And also I think maybe even a hair better uh, contrast here if we compare different sections like here and here. And so at the end of the day, um, does the A7R4's APS-C crop mode give you um, competitive resolution? It absolutely does. So as you can see, lots of advantages there. We've got additional resolution. The sensor, of course, is a very good one. And so it works well in crop mode. And there's also, as we've already explored, some buffer advantages when you shift into the APS-C mode. And so basically your buffer depth triples, both in RAW and JPEG files, giving you a lot of flexibility for shooting some sport or wildlife action. Now, as I said in our very first episode in this series, what I consider to be one of the greatest liabilities of the A7R Mark IV is that it doesn't have any options when it comes to reducing that file size, um, at least when you're shooting in RAW. There are some smaller bite size options when you're shooting in JPEG, but in RAW, it is the full pop or nothing, 61 megapixels, or unless you're going into the crop mode, that's the only way to reduce that that size. And of course, you know, when you go into APS-C crop mode, you're also applying the crop factor to the angle of view. So not always a desirable thing. And so I, I continue to uphold that if it was possible to correct that ver via firmware, that would be my absolute top pick for Sony to address via firmware. But ironically, while there are aren't options for reducing file size or reducing resolution, there are actually some options for increasing that resolution. And so of course, we'll look quickly at the difference between um, uncompressed and compressed RAW and how much of a difference that makes. But then beyond that, you can actually move up in both a four shot uh, pixel shift where you can combine four images into one and then an even expanded over, you know, the A7R Mark III's pixel shift an expansion to a 16 shot where you can actually produce uh, a some a file that's somewhere in the vicinity of 240-ish um, megapixels in terms of resolution. So truly, truly massive. Let's take a look at how all that plays out. 
So while unfortunately you have no options for lower levels of resolution, you do have some options, ironically, for increasing resolution. So starting off, let's look at a comparison between a compressed RAW and an uncompressed RAW. And so the uncompressed RAW basically doubles in file size from roughly 60 megabytes to about 120 megabytes. So do you get improvements there? I can see a minor amount of additional contrast in this image. If we look down in this area here, you can see that there is ever so slightly better levels of contrast. Again, we're not talking about anything super significant, and if you didn't compare them side by side, you would not see it necessarily. And to be frank, most of the time I shoot in compressed RAW, unless I'm in a really critical situation where that extra little degree might actually make a difference. On the a7R 4 you have two options when it comes to using pixel shift. And so the first, it combines four images or takes four images, and then you can combine those together and you actually end up with a 61 uh, megapixel resolution, though at a much larger file size because it contains more information. And so does it make a difference? Well, as we compare side by side here, uh, the difference is perhaps similar to what we saw in the difference between the compressed and the uncompressed raw in that it's there, it is not significant. And, and so, um, you know, I can see ever so slightly a little bit le better levels of contrast. You also get a little bit better color fidelity um, out of that. You get a tiny bit more resolution. But, you know, there are unique situations where this might be useful. In many situations, probably most photographers are going to say that's not a big enough difference to make it worth all the extra trouble. Now, the second pixel shift, shift option is the combining of 16 uh, different files into what ends up being uh, around a 241 or 242 megapixel uh, final image. Now, there's the file size is so huge here that after I've done the combination in the Sony soft software, and uh, let's just take a look at originals here. And so um, the original ARQ file put out by Sony here is nearly two gigabytes in size. Um, if I turn that into a DNG file, you can see it's 664 megabytes. And then likewise, the four shots has a resolution of 479 megabytes that will reduce down to 178 um, megabytes when converted into a DNG file. Now also if I create a TIFF file where I've reduced that um, uh, downsampled the 16 the resolution here into you know the 61 megapixel same file size resolution then uh, then we end up with a 664 four um, megabyte file. And so they end up being very, very large. Now, the other issue here is that I've got the DNG version here. And you'll see if I try to zoom into a pixel level, even though I have a, a very highly spec machine here, and I'm running, I believe, 32 gig of RAM, you will see that Lightroom doesn't actually even display it um, if I try to zoom into a pixel level. So what I've done is I showed you with the file size is I've down sampled to the same resolution. So we can kind of get an apples to apples comparison. So on the right, we have the, the 16 image uh, shot. On the left, we have the 14 image shot. And once again, while there is, I think a little bit better, maybe color saturation, the difference here between these two is so marginal that I just, I have a hard time seeing where I would actually use that 16 image situation. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't applications for pixel shift. I believe that there are, particularly for those maybe that shoot interiors of, you know, cathedrals or architecture, and uh, you have an opportunity to work from a tripod, and you just, your absolute priority is more detail and resolution. I would say that for most people, there are very few situations where they're going to need more resolution than what they've got natively in the a7r mark iii and so uh, to me pixel shift because of the additional steps required is 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 a very rare use type situation and for many people it will just be a gimmick that's what it's been for me to this point and and i've just not been in situations where i needed more resolution than what i could get even out of the a7r mark iii and so uh, that's certainly you know your mileage may vary according to your situation i just wanted to demonstrate how it all works in real life for you so hopefully this helps you to understand the pros and the cons of higher resolution and to help you to make that decision in moving ahead i will be 
following this up next week with my final review episode where I'll try to tie everything together and give you my final verdict. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to the image gallery, tons of photos there. You can find linkage to buying links if you'd like to order one for yourself. You can also follow me on social media or become a patron, sign up for my newsletter. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.